This is the Bet Central podcast. Let's make some profits. Hello and welcome to the Bet Central podcast. My name is Mitch Matiana, joined by an amazing analyst, uh, Grant. We're going to be jumping into the top seven Premier League teams. As you know, the Premier League returns this Friday. Grant, it all kicks off where student takes on master. I love these kind of games. Vincent Company, who took Burnley from the championship back into the Premier League, will play host to his old team, Manchester City. What a big one. Yeah, I mean, the first thing about this weekend is this Friday, Saturday, Sunday and Monday games, all in the first round. And in the second round as well, I see it similar with the Friday and the Monday kickoffs. I love it. I mean, the more different time slots there are, the more games I can watch. I think it makes sense. I don't know why the Premier League has so few Friday games. Um, so I'm, I'm, yeah, and I'm, I mean, this is partly because City are playing in the in the Super Cup next week, but still, I mean, it's I think it's cool to start the week the the, the round a bit earlier. And I mean, yeah, basically the question is, are, you know, are City going to just wipe the floor with everyone like like they did last year? Um, I mean, I mean, you know, we spoke it towards you know the end of the Champions League, um, but I think they have a, a, quite a difficult task this season for Guardiola because firstly he's lost. Gundogan, who we spoke about so much. I mean, he scores goals. He can play in a deep role and dictate play. He can send Haaland through on goal. And I mean, he's basically re- been replaced by Mateo Kovacic, who I know well from Chelsea. And he's capable of having really good performances and runs of form. But he doesn't score in really, he barely scores goals. And he, he hasn't got the same passing range as Gundogan. He's, he's a better dribbler. But I think that's a downgrade for them. So, I mean, that's quite a difficult thing for Guardiola to navigate. Who's going to actually replace someone so influential who's captaining them yeah. as well. So that's a huge loss. Um, and, I mean, they've been linked with now with Lucas Paqueta from West Ham. So, maybe he feels Kovacic isn't that man. and He thinks Kovacic should play maybe in the, like, be Rodri's deputy. Um, so, that's, um, yeah, I think that's a slight problem position. And, I mean, whilst Foden could step in there, I mean, he might be needed on the right because Mahrez has, has left and they haven't so far signed a replacement. Cole Palmer, of course, is a very talented player who you know, could step up, but maybe a big ask to replace Mahrez, who was such a you know big uh, producer of goals and assists, and he was just such a reliable like first sub or a kind of a rotation option just outside the best eleven. And yeah, and then he's got you know he's got guys like Cancelo. He's trying to you know shift. Um, he's now brought in got um, you know Guardiola at the back, who obviously he's a brilliant defender, but seventy odd million. I mean, you know Nathan Ake was outstanding last season, so maybe a, you know a, is that an upgrade? I mean. Is Guardiola going to play even better than Ake in his first year? And he's spoken himself about yeah. some players, you know, struggling a bit with motivation. Um, you won it all. It's sometimes a good time to leave when you won all the, you know, all you can win and you finish the cycle sort of. But they're trying to keep Walker and Bernardo Silva, but by offering them, you know, massive new contracts um, because they'd be so hard to replace. There's a few question marks for City this season, um, but. Uh, yeah, it's difficult to see anyone else winning the title. I mean, you consider how well Arsenal played last year, and it was still they're still quite a long way off City by the end. So, you know, despite the great season they had. So I mean, yeah, City yeah. are massive able to take this title. I mean, I like the game against Burnley to start, but you know, these sides met in the FA Cup not long ago, March, I believe, and City won six 0 and Haaland got a hat trick in about twenty five minutes. Um, so I, I do worry about Burnley in this game, even at they're at home now. Um, there'll be a great atmosphere. But Vincent Company hasn't maybe had the best transfer window he'd want. You know, his top scorer last year was Nathan Teller and on, on loan from Southampton. He hasn't been signed. He's, you know, playing for, for Saints in the in the championship and scoring already. Um, sorry, he assisted a goal in the first game, but he's um, he's going to be a main player for Southampton. So they haven't actually made that into a permanent deal. And then Ian Mudson as well, who was on loan from Chelsea, was in the, the championship team of the year. He hasn't been signed either. I thought they'd maybe sign him for 20, 25 million and, um, you know, just try to keep some of those players that were so pivotal you know, for them. But he's back in Chelsea and probably going to be part of Pochettino's sort of rotation plans. So it hasn't been the, the best winner for Burnley. Um, I do worry about their goal scorers. They've got a few you know, goal-scoring wingers that you know do well, like Saruri, for example. I mean, he had a good season last year and um, had a Lazio as well. But through the number nine position, I mean, Lyle Foster's there, the South African striker. I'd love to see him get some games. Yeah. And he also fought falling back on like Jared Rodriguez, 34 now. I mean, I do worry about Burnley this season. And I mean, it's hard to see anything but City taking a nice big win in this first game. I mean, we'll look at the odds, but it's hard to get value. I think City will probably win this game by a few goals. Yeah, so let's speak about the value because, I mean, I'm looking at the betting odds right now. You want to tap into the goals market, as you said, the last time they made up, it was quite a high scoreline. But what do you do? I mean, look, the, the go-to for most people right now, what he did last season, is maybe go 
Erling Haaland anytime goal scorer, but the odds on that is like 1.44. It's, <laughs> mm. it's a return that's quite difficult. There's no value on City like straight win or Haaland's just to score anytime. I mean, you have to really be you know creative in these things. I mean, the obvious markets, Man City went to zero, 2.15. That's, you know, a slightly better, that's obviously a lot better than just a straight win. Um, the handicaps are always like, you know, City minus one is 1.86. And not great, but you could put that in a, you know, you know, take it with with a few other games. City to you know minus two, so in other words, to win by three goals is three point one five. So that's a huge jump. I think that could be worth going for. Um, yeah, I think City could probably win by three goals in this game. I mean, on the Haaland front, you know, him to score two or more goals is usually the way to get value. Um, yeah. yeah, so that's three. So that's decent. You know, three. He, he you know, Gundogan's left, and he was um, occasionally on penalties. So maybe Haaland takes. More and so is Mares to be fair. So you know, Haaland will probably take all the penalties this season. There's a few extra goals for him there because there were you know quite a few games where he he actually let someone else take the penalty or you know someone else was on penalty duty. So I think two or more at three is um is pretty decent. Um, that's the only way to really do it in this game. Um, there is no there's no other way to get decent value besides just backing City to thrash Burnley. And then of course from City. Uh, Burnley, we move on over to Saturday's fixture. It's the first one, Arsenal, taking on Forest. Arsenal with kind of quite a few massive signings that they've made. Declan Rice, you know, coming through. Uh, just recently, this past week, they just announced David Rea. They got him alone from Brentford. So it looks like, I mean, Justin Timber as well at the back. So they, they, they're building quite a massive, massive squad in terms of what they did uh, last season. And taking on a Forest team that's got, you know, Kalo Navas, who was quite a shot stopper last season. Yeah, I mean, Arsenal was so good last season for, say, 80% of the season. I watched so many of their matches, pretty much every match, and they were so convincing in their wins. Besides maybe one or two games, like the Leeds game, for example, they were miles better than their opponents in those games. They loads of chances created, so solid at the back. And then, yeah, it kind of unraveled, and it it co- um, coincided with, you know, William Saliba getting injured. But, yeah, some poor results. We you know we obviously remember them throwing away 2-0 leads against West Ham and, and Liverpool, but also drawing 3-3 with Southampton. And then, of course, they lost 3-0 to Brighton, but, the you know, it was basically done by then. And losing home and away to City was key. You know, you have to get something off your direct rivals, even if you just get a draw and stop them from actually beating you. So, yeah, I mean, Arteta's gone big in this window. He's been backed. Declan Rice, I mean, I love as a player. I would love to have seen him come to Chelsea. He was a Chelsea youth player until 14. But he's, yeah, he's going to be probably Arsenal's, you know, captain in a year or two. And he could play as a number six in place of party, or he could play slightly to party's left. Maybe initially you'll play, you know, you know with party because um, Kai Havertz might be needed up front. Havertz might yeah. play as the number eight, you know, the left number eight eventually. That seems to be Arteta's plan. And Jacques has gone there, so they've replaced basically a defensive midfielder who was getting forward a lot um, with a striker who's not going to have to play deeper or a player that's played a lot as a striker having to play deeper again. It changes the balance of the team quite a lot. Um, I mean, Havertz is a weird one. He's kind of an enigma. He he has some really good games. He's He works very hard. He likes, you know, he likes a scrap, but he doesn't score nearly yeah. enough goals. And he's not very creative. Like, if you look, um, he gets very few assists. You don't see him playing through balls. Um Yes, yeah, so it's, it's kind of an interesting one. Maybe he's going to add a lot of aerial strength coming from deep arriving in the in the box. Um, yeah, so I mean, those yeah, those are two obviously massive signings they're expecting a lot from. Uh, I think Timber's a smart signing. Looks like he's going to play left back a lot probably because you know Zinchenko's injured right now and Tierney's not really trusted. Plus he gives cover just in across the back four in general, so you don't have to play Rob Holding um, like because he came into the side and struggled so much. And also Liba looks like he's fit, so. Yeah, things are looking pretty rosy for Arsenal. And, I mean, to actually, it's a big ask for them to, to do as well as last season because they've got the Champions League commitment now. And that's going to really yeah. test their energy levels. You know, the, the Europa League last year didn't because they, they got a buy in the one round for topping the group. They could rotate players. They had some nice scheduling. Um, so it wasn't too demanding. The Champions League will be. Um, and, you, and you mentioned David Raya. Slightly strange one because now they've got two number one keepers who are going to be fighting for their jersey exactly. and it's not always yeah. that, that that good i mean i mean you've seen that you know in the past um with you know psg and other clubs have had two number ones and trying to rotate between competitions it doesn't always work eventually one does sort of take the jersey or one has to leave i think it kind of disrupts ramsdale but maybe a bit blow to his confidence that they that they've um, brought in someone who's could you know could take his jersey 
But anyway, Arteta obviously feels he needs more quality there. Um, I, I, I struggle to see Arsenal winning the league because last year they had such a free schedule and now they yeah. have such a busy one and I just can't see it. So, I mean, Forest is a nice game to start off with. You know, Forest are a really good home team, or they were last season. Of course, we're going to have to base stats on last season. They're really good last season at home. Terrible on the road. Um, so you'd think Arsenal will get a nice big win to start off the season here. Of course, they've sold Matt Ryan, you know, to Forest. Um, so that'd be just an interesting little, yeah, sub sub story to see how <laughs> their former keeper does against them. Um, yeah, I mean, Forest slightly weird situation because what we hear from that, you know, they've been struggling to pay off their transfer fees. They signed so many players, um, and they're, they're behind on payments. They're behind on some salaries. So it's a bit of a concern when you sign like these thirty players. Um, and some of the you know, deals not very good, like the Chris Wood one, where they you played a couple of games and triggered a, a purchase option, and then he was injured, and he's not very young or suitable to a smaller team, in my opinion, because he doesn't really have much mobility. And they haven't had a great yeah. window either. You know, there's really Langer from United, um, Ola Ena from Torino, quite decent athletic players, speed, but not a great window. So, I mean, I think, yeah, I think I think Arsenal could get a nice big win to start the season. Um, and for Havertz, I mean, he needs to get a goal early on if he's playing up top to just get everyone behind him. Um, I mean, Arsenal's odds are pathetic in this game, 1.19. Just like City yeah, now, that you're going to have to be creative. Wow. Yeah, look, I mean, for me personally, I'm looking at the more of the goal scorers. I think, you know, backing a Bukayo Saka in a game like this might come in because he's also on... Well, I don't even know if he's on penalties because it's between him and Martin Odegaard because Saka has missed quite a few and he missed a couple of during preseason. So, I mean, when you're looking at, you know, the goal scoring, the goal scorers, uh, the odds are quite high. Like Kai is up at 2.2, uh, Nketiah 2.25, Martinelli also 2.2. Uh, uh, well, Trossard also has showed up a couple of times. It's also 2.2. I think I'd be leaning more in terms of, you know, selecting a player to at least get one of the goals. Mm, yeah, I think you might be onto something. I mean, probably of all those, I fancy Martinelli the most because Havertz isn't a reliable scorer. We don't know exactly what role he's going to play. Um, Trossard, yeah. probably, you know, he's a toss-up to start. Saka's a good one, of course, because his odds are actually quite decent at 2.4. He's better odds than some oh, other yeah. players. And Odegaard as well, as many goals he scored last year, if 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 Havertz is going to play in that midfield three with him, he'll have to be a bit more conservative because they'll have to balance that out. He hasn't got Jack as defensive now on the opposite side. So, he might score slightly fewer goals. Um, so I think Saka could be the one to go for. Um, and as you say, we don't know if he's on penalties, but he's taken a fair few for them. Um, he might have kept those duties. But I, I like Martinelli probably as the, the scorer because, yeah, he's going to be able to get into scoring positions with, with Havertz vacating that area. So, I mean, I like him at 2.2. Otherwise, again, you're looking at the handicap markets. Arsenal maybe minus one. No, that's not even good enough. Arsenal Mountain minus two, 2.35. Yeah. Um, that's not great odds at all. I mean, yeah, it's difficult. I think the scorer markets might represent the best value in, in this one, as you said. Uh, let's stay in North London because I want to touch on Tottenham. Uh, look, I'm going to be honest, Grant. I, I always try to keep my finger on the pulse in terms of transfers, who people get in. The two signings that Spurs have made besides James Madison, I have no idea of what the direction that Big Ange is going in terms of their signings. Their last preseason game against Barcelona, it seemed great. Oliver Skip scoring two goals. But of course, inevitably, them losing it 4-2. It is a London derby in this one. Uh, they travel to Brentford. Brentford, of course, without the services of Ivan Tony, who's serving his ban. But still, Brentford without Tony, they still even scored last season. I mean, Mbwembu is definitely going to be one of those players that people are going to be looking at in that Brentford squad. Yeah, yeah, Spurs are oh, interesting one this season. I mean, they feel like they're in a, a real transition at the moment. We don't know for sure if Kane's staying or if he's going to Bayern. Um, he seems like he set a sort of a, his own personal limit of like the first league game to actually have some clarity. I mean, he wouldn't want to be playing for Spurs in the first match and then signing for Bayern on the Monday. You know, it's um, it's a weird situation. So you'll look, you know, you'll be looking for some clarity, and if that move is looking likely or if he's really behind it he might not play the first match it's quite a difficult situation on that front of course with um with the new coach um and Postostoglu, he's gonna he's very attacking coach he likes inverted fullbacks he's gonna you know have much more attacking setup than some of his predecessors i mean i love the madison signing i mean he's a super creative 
Yeah. And if Kane actually stays, him and Madison should develop a great relationship. They've got they brought Pulis- they've made Pulisevsky's move permanent, and they got a discount on that one by renegotiating it. I think he's he was great before a little dip, but he was really good when when he initially came. Got a huge number of assists. Um, Mickey van der Ven they brought in from Wolfsburg, who seems like just a hyper aggressive centre back, which they really have in Christian Romero. So um, yeah, it's interesting to see how those two work together. Um, it could be quite fun to watch. I mean, just like crazy centre backs committing themselves. And quite an open setup with the, when they were with this coach. Um, in goal, you know, Hugo Lloris, um, he's basically been allowed to sort of look for the next move. And they brought in Vicario from, from Empoli. But that's still a slight worry in that position. I mean, I could see them playing out some weird games this season, like high scoring matches with tons of goals leaked and tons of goals scored. Yeah. Um, and if Kane leaves, what do they do? I mean, do they, they go out big and sign a big striker? Do they try and trust someone like Richarlison to play as a nine? And get in, you know, a decent rotation sort of strike or you know, someone with a big upside. I think that kind of dominates this season, the season previous. Like, will Kane stay or go? Um, I hope he goes because I'd love to see him challenge himself in a new league. I don't think it says a lot about his ambition to like be focused on a goal scoring record. I mean, um, there's still time for him to come back to the Premier League and do that. But I mean, trophies or you know, team team based honors are always going to be worth more. Especially, you know, after you retire. I mean, yeah, your record goal scorer is great and all that. But OP challenges himself and goes. And then, yeah, then Spurs might be more like a seventh or eighth challenging team who just score a ton of goals and are building something. Um, it really does depend a lot on that. And I mean, as you said, Brentford, they're quite a, they're going to be a difficult first opponent to, to you know, to be away from home. The Ivan Tony thing is quite a big deal. Um, yeah. He's so good and so key to their style. So, you know, Johan Vissa probably is going to play um, up top. And he scored goals often coming off the left. He's a good player. But, yeah, I do worry about them in these first few months without Tony. Um, you know, Kevin Charters moved from Freiburg. He's been made permanent. He looks like a good winger. He played a few, got a few starts last season. But not a massive transfer winner from them at all. Um, yeah, and, of course, you know, they've, Raya's gone. So, yeah, this it's, it's an interesting one to see how Brentford get on. But I think they'll, be, they'll have a good season. They'll be probably about 10th. But... In the first game, I I think there might just be a lot of goals. Um, even without um without Tony, I think and Buemo, Visa, and these guys can score goals. So, yeah, Spurs I think could be very entertaining. That's how I see them this season. Yeah. Um, good watch and interesting case study with a new coach, new formation, all that stuff. So, I would back goals in this game probably. Um, as a first betting tip, I mean, yeah, both teams to score for example, one point five two is a bit low, but if you go for something like over three point five goals in the game. 2.7, I think that's quite possible. There could be four goals. This could be 2-2 two, two or 3-2, three, 3-1 two, um, three, to either side. So, yeah, I'm backing goals. Um, and on the scorers, I wouldn't back Kane until I see he's st- starting. Um, and if he is starting, even if he does go or if he stays, he's going to be very keen to impress. So him at any time at two is pretty good considering what we said about Harlan's odds. And Kane pretty much, he got only a couple goals less in, in you know in open play than Harlan last season. Yeah, uh, you got something where you get like thirty goals, twenty five open play or something. Kane was really good season, so yeah. he's probably the one to back there. Or um, Son to actually go back to his best level at three point one five. Um, he had a poor season last year, but he could be one to back to kind of have a slight revival. Uh, from I think the big game for this weekend, everyone's directing their eyes on this one: Chelsea taking on Liverpool. I think with both teams, massive signings. Also, both of them going for Olivia at Southampton. So that's quite interesting. Uh, yeah, I mean, Grant, you're a Chelsea fan. Christopher and Gungu out till December. I mean, you got Nicholas Jackson, but will will he be enough in terms of, you know, starting off the prem for you guys? You have the veteran services of Raheem Sterling on the right. Mudrick's got the number 10 jersey. Hopefully that revives and gives him a little bit of energy. I mean, we've seen what he did when he was back um, in the Ukraine. So it's going to be interesting to see what he does for Chelsea now in the start of the season. Your thoughts of Chelsea, mm. Liverpool? Yeah, Chelsea, are, it's, it's going to be very, very interesting for any, well, obviously for supporters, but even from the outside of the season because it's such a young squad. I mean, Ben Shaw has been made vice captain. He's, he's 26 and he's the third oldest player in the squad. The only players older than 26 are, are Sterling and Silva. Um, so, yeah, and, and you say the firepower is a big question mark. It was a question mark last season with Havertz up top. Uh, we've seen Lukaku you know, fail, and he's currently still on the books, but definitely not part of the plans. Um, so it's, it's quite a big ask for Jackson, Nicholas Jackson, to be the first choice nine and 
sort of lead the line, even though he's looked really, really good in preseason, um, running behind, holding up play and doing all sorts of really good things for young forward. It's a huge ask for him. I don't know the status of Armando Broyo, if he's going to be fit enough to be on the bench and, and you know, give an option um, after his serious knee injury. But yeah, the attack is a slight worry. Well, it's a major worry. Um, and even behind that, you're going to have young players probably starting like Chukwameka could be the number 10. And Enzo Fernandez doesn't have a real real partner. I mean, it's probably going to be Conor Gallagher. But, you know, the Caicedo deal is still up in the air. There's Romeo Lavia, who Chelsea apparently are, are bidding for. But there's something suspicious going on there because if, he's, if his asking price is 50 million, I don't see why he'd bid 48 million. It just seems unnecessary. You can have the deal done with for two extra million. And it's, I don't know, I'm worried that this is more about briefing and trying to get Brighton to shift on Caicedo's price. Either way, one of them have to come in. And if Caicedo comes into partner Enzo Fernandez, that's a huge upgrade. I mean, that midfield would be really exciting. If he doesn't, yeah. and we've got Gallagher, Andre Santos, or maybe Lavia or some other players, the midfield's a huge question mark. The back At the back, the team looks really sorted. You know, there's so many options there. Um, Levi Cole has come back from Brighton. He's going to be starting. He's a top young player. Axel Dissas, he's come in from Monaco. He's caught this still Chalabar, Thiago Silva. And Buddy Shield when he's fit, Wesley Fofana probably out for the season. So there's plenty of depth at the back. Reese James is now captain, and he's got some backup with you know Malagusto coming in from from Leon. So a lot of the positions look really solid. The goalkeeper not because you still kept Kepa, and he apparently has interest in Bayern Munich to sign him, which just seems too good to be true. I won't celebrate that until that's officially done. Um, and Robert Sanchez came in, but he's yeah he's. A difficult one. He's obviously talented, but similar to Kepa, he makes a lot of mistakes. And um, I'm still hopeful he'll be number one over Kepa in the, for the weekend, but I'm not sure. There's a lot of question marks for Chelsea. I mean, will they score goals? Do they have an actual midfield? And they're such a young team. I mean, at least Poch is a really good coach. Is going to demand some pressing and high energy and actual effort. So uh, I think fans are optimistic, but realistic. If he can squeeze into the top four, it would have been an amazing job. But more likely it's going to be around sixth, fifth, sixth. Um, that's probably how I see the Chelsea thing. I mean, Liverpool have a weird, they've had kind of a weird summer. They've sold their two holding midfielders. Um, they've got good good money for both, considering the ages. They haven't signed a replacement there. And in their last friendly, they were playing, you know, McAllister and Sobeschlei as a midfield two, basically, um, which is, is going to be crazy. They play like this this weekend with McAllister as a six. I mean, they're going to have a front four probably there with Jota, Salah. Diaz, you know, these guys making a front four. Um, there could be goals galore, honestly. Uh, I, yeah, it's it's quite interesting to see how they set up. Um, they're just not really equipped to to defend in that midfield. Even with Alexander-Arnold inverting, you're yeah. asking, you know, Konate to be a monster every single week because it's not like there's a right winger that drops back to defend. You know, if it's Salah, it's, then it's basically Konate doing two jobs. Um, so it's an interesting season for them like Chelsea trying to get back into the top four. I hope this first game is full of goals because Liverpool are kind of set up just to be like that. Um, and yeah, and I don't think either side's going to have that defence midfielder signed by the weekend. Exactly. Yeah. Enough, but, uh, I mean, I've got a feeling both could sign a player like on Friday um, and miss the deadline and the player doesn't play. But I can't, yeah, I can't see either side having a holding midfielder. So we should see goals. Um, we should see goals, definitely, I mean, yeah. Yeah, we should. I mean, over 3.5 goals is 2.6 in this game. I'm sure there'll be goals. I mean, it seems to play out some normal draws, but hopefully we don't, we don't see anything like that. Um, as for the results, I wouldn't really be keen to back in. I think any of the three could happen, so I'm a bit reluctant to say any of those options for sure. Um, and then on the goals front, I mean, yeah, I mean, for Chelsea, it's Jackson. I mean, who are you going to back to score? Sterling's had a poor preseason, and there's, you know, Mudrick might not start. He might start, he might not, but he might go with someone more conservative on that side, like Ian Martin could play on the wing. Um, so, yeah, I, I think I think Nkunku might have played off the left if he'd been fit with with, with Mudrik on the bench, So because, because Chukwumeka's been playing as the 10. So it's basically Jackson from the Chelsea side, and you've got Salah, you've got Nunes, Gakpo. I mean, they're going to play four, a front four, basically. Um, Jota Diaz, Gakpo, and, and Salah. So... Yeah. Yes. One of those are going to score, I'm sure. I just can't see Liverpool not scoring at least one goal in this game, if not more, because when you have that at the lineup, you, you're surely going to score. Um, yeah, so an exciting game away. It's a really good start to the season.
Look, I mean, looking historically in the recent fixtures, it's always been a draw between Chelsea and Liverpool. So are we going to be tapping into more the golds market going into this one? I think, as we said, no defensive midfielder uh, for both sides. So we can expect a little bit more openness within those that midfield. So what are you looking at in terms of betting tips? Yeah, I think over 3.5 goals um, because that's where you start getting good value in the, in the odds. Um both teams to score is one point five. I mean, you could have that in like a, like a you know a multiplier slip with a few games. Um, but as you say, there've been a lot of draws lately. I, I can't remember exactly, but it's like five or five of the last six or something have been draws. They, these teams keep sharing the spoils. So a draw at three point five five. I mean, those are crazy good odds. And both teams would probably be quite satisfied with that. It's a good start for Chelsea to get a, a point in the first game as they build something. Liverpool is still an away game at a at a big rival for the for Champions League spot, so probably draws a good result. So I mean that could be a way to go at three point five five. It looks pretty, you know, great value. So that's probably the two different options. I mean maybe I'd look at the lineups and decide closer to kickoff as well, um, just in case there's a weird surprise. I don't know what it could be. For example, if we could play Gomez at right back, Alexander Arnold as an actual midfielder, and then have a more yeah. balanced side, something along those lines. Um, or Chelsea could have something creative as well, who knows? So, yeah, um, maybe I'd want to see the lineups and then take a more of an instinctual bet closer to the kickoff. Yeah. All right. So let's move on over. Let's take a look at what's happening in terms of Manchester United. They're going to be only on action uh, on Monday. Uh, United also making a few good signings. They're going to be taking on. Uh, I've been seeing a lot of United fans get scared of this because Wolves will have a new manager bounce in the first a game week because it seems like Wolves and Lupetegi have split ways. Uh, United signing Mason Mount seems like a good signing. I mean, it, uh, Lissandra Martinez and Varane are back. They seem healthy going into uh, this game. A lot of positivity with Harry Maguire might even joining West Ham. So a lot of good signs at Old Trafford. Yeah, they certainly are good signs. I mean, I'll just, I mean, I'll start with Wolves first because, yeah, as you say, they've literally got a new manager on the eve of the season. Lopetegui resigning is really an indication of how their season could go. I think he has the, you know, he sees the writing on the wall with their lack of recruitment. They've lost quite a few players. Um, they haven't gone out and bought many players. You know, they've got Matt Doherty um, from Atletico. Um, they've got Leo Lopez from Grasshoppers, but you know, nothing you're going to be particularly um, sort of optimistic about because they were they were bottom of the table when Lopetegui took over. He did a great job and took them up the league up the league with a, a strong run of home results. But then they've lost players like Diego Costa who was starting, John Martino, who's been a, a big figure for them over the recent years. Um yeah, the squad looks in a bit of a mess. You know, Nathan Collins was sold to Brentford. He might not have been starting, but I mean you've left yourself quite short at the at the back with depth. And of course Ruben Neves sold to Ali Lau. Um Raul Jimenez sold to Fulham. I mean, I don't know what's going on there. It seems like, you know, George Mendes was sort of part of the ownership group there and he hasn't, he's kind of just left them to possibly be relegated. I don't know what's going on. There's some, some, some suspicious stuff there. Um, and Gary Neal is coach, you know, he's his first real job because he was a caretaker that was kind of kept on last season by Bournemouth. He did a good job, but they didn't yeah. do think, you know, think, think him good enough to stay on as their permanent coach. So kind of a weird appointment, maybe also a bargain manager who doesn't earn a huge amount of money compared to some others. So I don't know what's going on there. Um, I think they could be relegated this year um, as it stands. And United, I mean, they've gone out and bought actual Ten Hag players that can play the start of play. I mean, especially Onana. He's miles better on the ball than De Gea. He can sweep up off his line. He's basically the opposite of De Gea in every way. You know, he's so aggressive. He's so far off his line. De Gea could barely take his feet off the chalk. And, and Onana doesn't like to be in his box if he can help it. So... Um, he's going to help get the playing style across, also having worked with Ten Hag at Ajax. So we'll see that style of football. I think he really wanted to play last season before he, yeah, he just had to be pragmatic and, and focus on results. Mount as well. He, um, Ten Hag knows from the Eredivisie when he was alone at Vitesse. He's going to play with Fernandez as one of two eights or tens, and that's more you know like what he wants to do in terms of style. Obviously, the signed Rasmus Holland as well from Atlanta. Atlanta, he got nine league goals in Serie A last season. So, really, a, a bit of a punt. He's a young player. He's at one season in the top five league. Um, he's got good size and speed. He's, I think, six foot three. Um, but, yeah, still, a, he's a project player 
of course, paying like 70 odd million for project players, the new reality in football now. Um, so I'm keen to see him play, but I don't think we should expect too much in his first season. So, I mean, I think United will have a good season. They were very, and it's, they were strong last year. And as you said, if they can sell Maguire, it'll feel like a, a massive win. It will be a bit of a sideshow, not to worry about, balance the books a bit. And still, I think Maguire could be good for West Ham in that in that team. Um, so everyone would win in that in that um, scenario. So yeah, I mean, I think they'll have a very strong season. I, I personally think you know City and United and and Arsenal look pretty nailed on to get top four. Um, they're just really far along in their sort of in their projects, if you want to call it that. Whereas the other teams aren't. You have new coaches and the end of cycles at you know at other clubs like Liverpool. Um, yeah. So I think United will be really solid. And yeah, we'll be in the top three. Um, and I mean, for this game, I think they're gonna they're gonna surely beat Wolves on Monday at Old Trafford. They were brilliant at Old Trafford on the ten hour last year, and Wolves look a shambles. So yeah, this looks like another banker. And we've said that already about Arsenal and City. So if you're creative with these three games, you could maybe go for a couple of handicap wins. Let's say all three teams to win by you know two goals or more, and get a nice little some nice odds there um, in total. And then, of course, uh, we move on over. I want to jump into uh, Newcastle. They're going to be taking on Villa. Uh, Newcastle, I think we all expected them to maybe to go a little bit flashy this window, but it seems like they were quite conservative with how they went about it. Mm. Yeah, they've been like that since their owners took over. They've been quite measured. They haven't had crazy windows signing, you know, 10, 11, 12 players. They've basically done the opposite of what Chelsea's owners have done. You know, Chelsea have had, you know, signing tons of players in January windows, you know, offloading 15 players in the window and signing a whole new team. It takes a long time to actually have all those players bid in. And it's hard for them to bid in without, you know, actual core players around them to help them settle and have structure. So Newcastle have done the opposite. They've been more thoughtful. And I know for a fact that they've lost out on some of their, their you know, their main targets. You know, Sobichlai went to Liverpool. He was a, a major target for them. But Liverpool, of course, have a lot more allure because... They can probably pay slightly higher salaries and with the history. Um, and James Madison was a target as well. We know he was close to joining Newcastle in January and he went to Spurs instead, again, probably for the highest salary and to live in London. So they lost out on a couple of targets, but um, it's Santino Livermento from Southampton, who's a, got a big upside as a young fullback, even though he was injured all of last season. Big fee as well, 32 million. Um, so probably Trippier's long term replacement. It's on Harvey Barnes, who's again got a big upside. He's um, maybe better in a counter attacking style, but Newcastle do play like that, you know, in quite a few games. I think he'll be an upgrade on St. Maximum in terms of consistency and, and goal scoring. Um, Sandra Tonali is the big one. And I mean, he's got a huge fee. He's very young. Um, I still think he's got a huge amount of development to do. Um, it's very inconsistent in his game, you know, one good action, three or four bad ones. Yeah, but Tonali, I'm not 100% sold on as a signing. I mean, you know, it's Longstaff was playing on that right side of the midfield and was giving a lot of defensive balance. Yeah. Tonali's, he can play deeper, but I don't think he necessarily has a lot of steel to his game and he's very inconsistent. He's, he is a young player. Um, I'm not, a, I'm not cons- convinced you're going to see a huge amount from him in his first season. I think they've also overpaid. I mean, AC Milan were biting off their hand to get this deal done and then have kind of rebuilt the whole squad with that money. Um, so I'm not as high on him as, as some people are. So I think it'll be similar to the lineup from last season. Maybe Barnes comes in on the left for St. Maximin or um, or even he's on the bench and Joe Linson's playing off the left or Willock. And it's it's maybe the similar lineup with a little bit more bench options to to help them. And they might still not be done in the window. I still think there could be another, maybe a right centre-back coming in. So, yeah, yeah. It's, they're very smart. They don't disrupt their dressing room too much with a lot of foreigners They you know that maybe don't settle in, sign a lot of British players. Um, the odd foreign player, and then they kind of build slowly from summer to summer, or window to window. So I think it's relatively smart. Again, for them, they'll be pushing for the top four, but they're in the Champions League, and that's going to be a huge, hugely demanding for them. Exactly. Um, yeah, and you can imagine those nights at St. James's Park in the Champions League will be absolutely rocking. They'll probably beat some really good sides. I think they're in pot four in the Champions League, so they're going to get a tough group. And they probably will beat some really big European names at home. But then, you know, two or three days later, they're going to play an away game. I think they could drop a lot more points. Even going into Champions League games, the previous match, they might have their minds on, you know, hosting a Milan club or Real Madrid or something. And you could see, yeah, them being a bit distracted. So I think 
going to be harder for them in the first half of the season when the group stages are happening. And maybe after this, after the Christmas break, they'll be a bit more consistent in the league. They're pushing for fourth with Chelsea, with Liverpool, with Spurs. Basically, I think for one spot in the Champions League. Although, with the new Champions League rules, if if England um, have the most coefficient points, there could be five Champions League spots with the way um, UEFA has changed the, the Champions League rules. And England yeah. have been in the top two over recent years for the for points. So there could be five Champions League spots in the league this year. Um, which is great news for Newcastle. They're coming into the into the Champions League club at the right time with more spots. So, I mean, I, I'm looking forward to this season, but I think it would be far more inconsistent. Last year, they barely lost a game in the first half of the season. Only um, Liverpool beat them, sort of going into, I don't know, about Feb or something. I think they'll be more inconsistent this year. Um, and they're probably a one or two short in their window from what they would have wanted, having lost out on targets. Um, so, yeah, decent, decent window, but not maybe as good as they'd hoped. Yeah, I think let's just run through some of the fixtures quickly. Uh, we've done the top, you know, the top seven. Uh, some of the fixtures we can expect on Saturday. Let's go through a few uh, betting uh, tips on this one as well. Uh, Bournemouth, West Ham. Yeah, that's an interesting game. Um, West Ham had a weird window this this off season. Um, of course, they've sold Declan Rice for huge money and struggling to figure out how to spend it. Um there was a story in the Athletic about them sort of um, posting their transfer window requirements on a, a transfer forum, which is usually used for academy players trying to find loan moves, saying they need a left back, a centre back, a midfielder, a striker, and so forth. Um, and it seems like a bit of a war inside the club of whether Moyes gets the British players he wants, or they go more foreign and who they target. Um, they look like they're edging towards signing Maguire and McTominay. Uh, and that obviously is going to bring a lot of derision because we've seen them not quite delivering to United standards in recent years. But I think that actually suit Moyes' football really well. Maguire would be much more protected at the back. Um, he might even be their captain if he goes there. And McTominay is a weird one because he can actually get forward and score goals. You see that for Scotland, occasionally for United. Um, so he could maybe be a good partner, especially if they sign Alvarez. It's an Alvarez from Ajax to replace Rice. McTominay next term. I think that could be actually quite a, a better midfield than people probably give you know give it credit for. They've linked with Ward Prowse, yeah. Conor Gallagher. They made a bid but was rejected. So they seem to want sort of energy in that, that midfield area. Um, they've even been linked with you know Balogun now from from Arsenal. Um, Arsenal want to get some money in for him, and he could be a really good signing there, having you know ripped up um, league on last season for for Rem. So, I mean, yeah, I think West Ham could actually end up in better shape than people will give them credit for by the end of the window. Um, and Bournemouth, yeah, they had a really good finish to last season. I haven't had a massive window or anything you would, you would say, but um, strong at home. I think they could give West Ham a game, yeah, especially because West Ham haven't got their signing through the door yet. And they're going to have been a little bit of flux, I think, until the end of August. Um, look at Bournemouth, they lost Jefferson Loma to, you know, he went to Crystal Palace, which... I think it's a big loss. It was really key for them in the second half of last season. Um, you wouldn't say they've been big signings coming into the club at all. Um, yeah. And probably not anyone major leaving besides, you know, besides the one I mentioned in Lerma. So, yeah, I'm not quite sure where they're going to stand this season. They were, they were, they were bottom of the table, um, I think about 12 or 13 games from the end, and then they beat Liverpool and had a great run and stayed up. You do see them in a relegation battle. Um but generally, their games are exciting. So I'll back goals again in this game. Um, both teams have scored 1.6. Quite a safe bet. Maybe not a huge return, but that's probably how I'd go in this one. And then, of course, Brighton-Luton. Yeah. Brighton, I mean, they're exciting to watch, aren't they? I mean, we don't know exactly how they're going to be this season because they've lost McAllister. Caicedo, is, I still think, will probably go in the end. Um, it feels like one of those protracted sagas that eventually comes to an end and they lose him. They've probably got a player lined up already to you know to come in for like twenty five million. That'll be their next eighty million, ninety million sale. They signed um, you know Mahmoud Dahoud from Dortmund, who was um, you know highly regarded a few years ago and has kind of had a bit of a stagnation in his career. He's got a big upside. Joe Pedro from Watford is a good either nine or coming in from wide as a sort of left forward. James Milner, kind of a squad player, cover a few gaps in European competition. Um, so I wouldn't say the most inspiring window you've you've seen. Um, you know, if they lose, you know, Casado and McAllister, two massive losses in one window. 
Um, Levi Cole was, of course, left um, at centre back. They brought in, you know, Igor Julio from from Fiorentina as a replacement. That's a, a slight risk, you know. He's coming from a foreign league, um, a left footer in this demanding system. So it's difficult to know exactly where Brighton stand. But if you look at the attack, if they, you yeah. know, Ferguson's great, Inquizo is great, Matoma, that's a really nice one. You add Jar Pedro to that. You know, Welbeck still got his uses and. They're linked with a few other wingers like Mohamed Kudus from Ajax. They might not get him because it's competition, but one signing like that, and they could have an extremely exciting front four. And I mean, the yeah. Zerbi's so highly, highly regarded. Um, they, they, I'm pretty sure they'll beat Luton in this first game. Um, Luton, you could see at home in their tiny little stadium, which I think they can't play in, in the first game, but you know, we'll be in eventually. They'll probably get some results. You know, teams coming to that will be quite shocked by what they are facing with the crowd on top of them. But I think on the road, Luton could be. Um, a team that gets some hidings. The window hasn't been overly exciting. You know, Marvellous Nakamba from Villa is kind of like an okay um, offensive midfielder. It gives you a bit of balance. Um, Issa Cabaret on loan from, from Man City at right back. He's been on loan for a couple of, last, couple of seasons, a good right back. Yeah. Um, and Ross Barkley's come in, who, yeah, of course, I know well from Chelsea. He's a huge talent, but hard hard one to rely on with his injury record and his inconsistency. Yeah. So, yeah, I think Brighton despite the, maybe having a slightly slow start of the season, I think, because they're trying to get their squad sorted, um, I think they'll win this game by a, a, goal, a couple of goals. Um, I just can't see Luton having a solution for De Zerbi's style of play. Um, it's going to be a, a massive shock to them to come up to this high level and then face a team as good as this. I mean, Brighton are 1.32, so I mean, they're getting the odds of a big team now. Um, I mean, you're going to have to back them on the handicap, maybe to win by two goals at 1.9 or three goals at 3.25. Um yeah, it's, it's a tough one. They become like a, a big team in the odds now, so not that easy to get to extract value from. So we look at Everton taking on Fulham. Uh, now, of course, Fulham have had, had their issues. Mitrovic looking to also go to Saudi as well. I'm not sure if that's been resolved yet. Yeah, that's a huge. It's a huge deal. If they, you know, Mitrovic was so good last season. He finally, probably for the first time in his Premier League career, became a regular scorer at the, at the highest level. He'd always been a bit of a sort of a luxury nine. He could score a few headers, but you, you know, really didn't really deliver in the in the elite league. You know, in the championship, of course, he's smashing it up for Newcastle and um, and Fulham. Um, so yeah, he'd be a massive loss. And they've signed Raúl Jiménez, who I haven't seen anywhere near his best since his his terrible skull fracture. Um, he's a bit of a punt because if he gets back to his level before, he'd be a good signing and you know maybe cover a bit of the loss of Mitrovic, but. More I see him as Mitrovic's sort of alternative, ideally. Um, I'm much convinced by him and his being a top player anymore. I'm a bit worried on that front. They've signed Calvin Bassi at the back from Ajax. I mean, I've seen him a lot. He's got a lot of potential, but he's he's quite rash. Um, he's a bit all over the place as an aggressive left, left-footed left centre-back. Um, yeah. <clears throat> and, of course, William have signed a new contract and now could go to Saudi as well. Um, I think there's a tough season away to Fulham because they overperformed in the first half of last season thanks to a lot to Bern Leno's heroics and then they had a very difficult end of the season when they'd already secured 39 points and they were really pretty much safe. I think they'll have a tough season this year and sometimes you know Marcus Silva turned down moves to Saudi and sometimes you do that and then you suddenly find yourself sacked in three or four months you you know you might regret it. I'm just a bit worried that you, you won't see out the season and they'll have quite a tough year. And yeah, for this first game, um, it's difficult to know what to expect from Everton. They are generally quite solid under Dyche, but he, you know, until a couple of late wins, um, especially the big Brighton victory they got, they weren't doing particularly well. They're still in a relegation battle. He didn't shoot them away from that after he took over. Yeri Mina's mm -hmm. gone, and he was quite a big part of that, actually, then turning it around. He was good at the end of the season. And I mean, guys, like, they're signing like Ashley Young. We can cover, plug a few gaps and a few positions. And Dan Juma's coming from Villarreal. I think I do like him, and I think he should have gone to Everton in January instead of Spurs. He would have actually played, but he's gone there now, and he'll probably do okay. He'll give some cover to Covered Lewin and sometimes partner him and, and score a few goals. But again, they I can't see them being far away from the drop zone. Um, Daesh will probably keep them up, and he'll, he'll probably keep his job even if they're struggling. But again, I think they're yeah. a relegation threat, threatened club. Um, so not, this is not an easy one to bet on. Um, not Maybe one I want to stay away from, if anything. Um, I could see it being low scoring. You know, there's doubt over Mitrovic and Covey Lewin's fitness. Um, so maybe not that many goals. I would say maybe a low scoring one. 
Uh, then let's move over to our last fixture for this game week. Sheffield taking on Crystal Palace. Palace under Roy Hodgson have showed such good football. Eze, Michael Elise, those two obviously stand up with how they've been playing and how impressive they were last season. Could they keep that momentum? Well, I mean, I think for Palace, the massive talking point is, is losing Wolf Zaha. Uh, he's played, what, 350-plus games for the club, an absolute legend there. Um, and he's departed now, finally, on a free transfer. Really, I'm really surprised that he didn't go to a Champions League club. I really think he still got, he could rip up some leagues. You know, he's linked with PSG, and I think he would have killed that league. Um, he's gone, obviously, to Galatasaray, which I think is below the level he should be at. Um, no offence to them, but... Jefferson Lerma's come in. He gives him a bit more solidity in midfield, but it hasn't been a, a major window for them. Um, they signed Mateus Franca from Flamengo. He's a number nine who kind of floats a lot. Um, maybe not a frontline striker, but they've taken a sort of a bit of a, a risk on him, hoping for a big upside. I mean, they seem to be a bit short of cash. Um, they've been linked to Lewis Hall on loan from Chelsea to kind of plug a few gaps. I think Hodgson's going to be working with is pretty much what he has from last year, except Zaha, and that's always going to be a, a massive loss. And now, of course, Michael Elise is being strongly linked with both City as Mahrez's replacement and with Chelsea, who where he was a youth player at Chelsea, and they seem very keen on him. If they lost Elise, um, yeah, they'd be in huge trouble. I think they'd have to rely on Hodgson just eking out you know, win, yeah. one or wins with clean yeah. sheets. So, yeah, an interesting season awaits for them. Um, Sheffield United, I won't pretend I know particularly well. Um, they did amazingly well to come up last season. They also had a good FA Cup run. Um, yeah, not a, a massive window either because most of these clubs are a bit reluctant to spend big. And then if they go down, they could end up like some of these other clubs, the Boltons and so forth, that are have kind of vanished off the face of the earth after living beyond their means. Um, so, I mean, Sheffield United window, yeah, you wouldn't say it's overly impressive. Not a lot of well known players. Um, a couple of guys coming in from, you know, from a player coming from Sweden, from Ligue 1, from Ligue 1 in France. Mostly they've kept what they had. Um, of course, they have lost Elimad and Di to Marseille, and he's a big loss because he's really good forward. He's did well at the World Cup for Senegal. I wanted to see him play in the in the Premier League. He's only he played once yeah. for them when he, you know, before they got relegated, but he's never played in the top flight. I think losing him is a big blow. Um, yeah, I think they've made a mistake. They're not really doing everything to keep him. So, I mean, for the first game, they'll be quite good at home, of course. Um, Sheffield United with their very vocal supports, you know, at Bramwell Lane. And Palace, I worry about a bit. They're still reliant on Eze now and Elise. Maybe they can step up, but I worry about them this season. Um, so this really could feel like a bit of a relegation battle between two teams there. So I'm not quite sure how to go on the betting front. Um those scoring, I'm actually not sure. This one I might stay away from. I want to see these two teams a bit more, maybe before I'm willing to take a risk on betting on them. Well, there we go. There, the first podcast done. Premier League returns this Friday. I'm so excited for it, Grant. Yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be interesting to see how things go. Uh, I don't think we touched on Villa, if I'm not mistaken. Did we touch on Villa? Yeah, Villa, Villa we uh, skipped past Ashi. You know, I got a bit involved in um, talking about the other games. But yeah, I mean, Villa are an interesting one this season. They've had quite a big window with um, Emery in charge. He's attracting some big name players, um, which is exciting. You know, they, they go to Newcastle in the first game and sort of after covering Newcastle, I didn't really go on to Villa. But they're going to be very intriguing this season. Emery did, did an absolutely amazing job last year. Um, they haven't sat. They rested on their laurels. They've backed him. They signed Yuri Tillemans on a free from Leicester. Again, a player that could recapture you know, the sort of level that we're seeing him linked with Man United and Arsenal and so forth before. Um, Paul Torres as well, coming from Villarreal. That's a real coup because they he was linked with Man United very strongly and at one point at least, and they've got him to, to Villa. I'm quite keen to see if, how they sort this out. I mean, they've got, a lot, they've got three left-footed centre-backs now, with Torres, Mings and Diego Carlos. We could see two of them together and see how that plays out. And the other one that's gone a bit under the radar is Musa Diaby from Bayer Leverkusen. I mean, he did some good stuff in the Champions League last season. He's a proper dynamic left-footed winger who's probably going to be playing up top a lot of games with um, with Ollie Watkins. And he's looked really sharp in preseason, running in behind the fences. So, I mean, they've done it. They've had an exciting window. Um, they seem to have upgraded 
sort of all three departments of their team in the defence, the midfield, and the attack. Um, so I think they'll have a good season again. Europe, you know, Europe will have a massive toll on them, especially because Emery will put so much attention on it. He, I wouldn't be surprised if he gets them quite deep into the, you know, into Europe because of his experience in, the, in those competitions, and then that will affect the league form. So I mean, this in terms of betting on the first game, quite a tough one um, because Villa thrashed Newcastle at Villa Park last year, but this is of course it's at um, St James's. So um, yeah, another one I'm a bit uh, fearful of. Um, maybe I'd say New- Newcastle straight win at 1.76 is probably the most safe bet. But again, Villa could take a point there. Maybe another game I want to see the lineups and then just get a gut feel of how the teams look and how their balance is in their, in their, sort of in their tactical setup. So, yeah, some exciting games. I know that the Chelsea Liverpool wants to pick, um, in my opinion. You're going to see lots of new players, new coach for Chelsea. Um, so that's, for me, the most exciting one. I don't know what you think. Grant, as always, thank you so much. Well, that's how we wrap things up. If you want to, you know, let us know who you backing, how you're going to be going about in terms of sports betting, just by simply tagging us at Bedfoes. And let us give us your thoughts on your team and what you expect for this season. I've been Mitch Matiana. That's been Grant. See you again. Bye.